All right. Hello. Thanks a lot, Sam. Hello, hello. OK. So let me introduce myself. I am James. I'm a GDE in machine learning based in Bangkok. And I'm also a data scientist at Agoda. So like last month, I had a lucky chance to go to Mountain View and attend the TensorFlow Summit for the second time. So uh, this is like a one, one day event that you like, I met a lot of like TensorFlow people over there. It was like very fun and very nice. Uh, let's see how it looks like in two minutes. Yeah. All right. So that's the the le recap in two minutes. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to pick some of the topics that I'm excited about and like basically highlight and uh, show you the the topic that I pick. So before I start, I just want to learn more about you guys. So how many of you use TensorFlow? in your daily job. Oh, nice. And how many of you like use machine learning in your daily job? All right, cool, cool. So I think this talk will be like most relevant for those of you who are using TensorFlow. But if, if you're a beginner to TensorFlow, then I hope that is like would inspire you to learn more about TensorFlow. So let's Let's start the first one. The first topic that I pick is tf.data. So the reasons why I picked this one, because in machine learning, data pipelining is extremely important. And before we have tf.data, like there are several ways, like many ways that we can feed data into TensorFlow graph. I think the most naive way is to use tf.constant and put like NumPy array on it. So it's highly inefficient. Uh, a bit better way is to do the feed dig in the session.run. Like basically you write the Python code, like do data preparation in NumPy and then do shuffle bash and you basically feed it into your TensorFlow graph using session.run and feed dig. That's a bit better, but still not the best way. And the last thing, the, uh, I think the most efficient way before we have tf.data is to use something called QRunner. And basically you write the TensorFlow graph to do data preparation and like use QRunner to, to feed data into the uh, GPU or something like that. But the problem with QRunner is it's like very difficult to work with, especially if you want to do something complicated. So that's the reasons why they come up with this tf.data API. So they promise us like tf.data API should be first fast, flexible, and easy to use. So they abstract away a lot of stuff that we have to do it by ourselves. 
and they like predefined everything and you can basically do almost every everything regarding data pipelining using tf.data. The idea of tf.data is, is basically ETL2 for TensorFlow. I know like most of you would probably know what is what ETL is. So the extraction part, so tf.data allows you to extract data from various data source, like it can be a NumPy array, or it can be a text file, image, or even CSV file, something like that. Second thing, it also allowed you to do to alter data representation or extract features, and also do data augmentation, shuffle data, batch your data. So this is the tran transformation part. And lastly, the load part. So you like you have to load your data into TensorFlow Graph, like to run on GPU or something like that. So this is the last part. So let's see the code. The, the E part, extract, extraction part. So let's say you have a list of files. In this case, it's like a TF record files, and you want to uh, extract the data from, from TF records. So you can do just like these two lines, pretty simple. And you want to shuffle and uh, do like MIDI bash and something like that. This is the transformation part. You can also like extract features on this part or do data augmentation, something like that. And the last part is to tell TensorFlow how you're gonna feed that data into the TensorFlow graph and train it on your device. So this is, you can do this make one short iterator and then iterator.getNext. Basically, uh, you can feed that features, the last part, into your TensorFlow graph. So let's talk a bit about performance, the first one. They have some tips that basically can speed up your TensorFlow, the data, data set uh, API. The first thing is very easy is to, if you have a lot, very large files log, or like many, many files, uh, you can load data in parallel using this uh, argument, non-parallel reads. And another thing that I think this is very exciting is you can do something called data.prefetch to device. So this function makes sure that for the next batch, it will load the next batch of your data into, your, into the device memory. So let's say you are running this, like the current batch, and it makes sure that the next one is already in memory, so when we want to run the next one, it's like you can load it immediately. Flexibility. So the flexibility of data set API stem from the fact that they, uh, they use functional style. So you can do data set dot map or dot filter dot flat map. And basically you put a function that you, let's say you have a function that extract image. Like you, you write a function that extract image using TensorFlow graph, right? So you can put that function inside the dataset.map to extract your, your, your image data. So in this case, like it's very flexible because you can define any function and then you just put it in, in the dataset.map. And yeah, you, can, you, you have like filter, flat map, and other stuff, functional stuff. And also now it support nested structures like dictionary, and it also support the spa tensor. And also, if you don't want to write the function using TensorFlow, you can also write your function using Python instead. So you can do this with a dataset.from generator. And dataset.from generator will take Python function, like not a TensorFlow. You don't have to write TensorFlow code. You write TensorFlow fun Python function, and then you can use the from generator. But of course, the performance will not like, wouldn't be uh, as good as the, the one that you define with TensorFlow code. 
And lastly, you can also, if you're a hardcore guy, you can also write your custom op kernel using C++, right? And ease of use. So tf.data designed a way that it also support eager execution mode. How many of you know about eager execution? All right, cool. So like eager execution is basically the way that uh, let you, so it's, it's a PyTorch way of doing TensorFlow, basically, one word. Or it like let you uh, work with TensorFlow in a Pythonic way, defined by run. And it's like much easier than the using like doing the graph first and then run later or something like that. So for example here, let's say you have data set. So you can think of data set as a iterator. And you can just do this for loop, like for bash in data set and put that bash inside that train model. So this is like very Pythonic way. And another thing is they also have like pre-made function that kind of like encapsulate all the, uh, I, I show you like it, it makes the, the data pipelining much easier for the standard case. So before, I, I showed you before that if you want to do shuffle, repeat, and you want to like extract the, you have the TF record and you want to extract something so that it can be consu consumed by the uh, TensorFlow model, you can do the TF plus single example or something like that. So they put it in one single function called make, make bash feature data set so that this is like very easy, very convenient. Another thing is now they support CSV. So you can do make CSV data set and you can think of it just like pandas.vcsv. This is very convenient. And once you get data set, you have like iterable and you can do like for loop to get data into the, your TensorFlow model. So to recap, TensorFlow data is like fast, flexible, and easy to use. And I highly recommend for those of you who uh, want to start using TensorFlow or don't use tf.data, I highly recommend you to move to tf.data for data pipelining. Second thing I want to talk about is the practitioner guide law high level APIs. So, okay, the reasons why I picked this one, because, okay, I myself like, re like use this estimator or high, le high level API for a while, and I think it's highly convenient, like it's much easier to use than the, like it, it's much easy, like it makes my life very, very easy when I do TensorFlow code. So that's why I picked this one and I will try to convince you why it's like uh, very easy. So for, for high, high level API, the core object of high level API is something called estimator. So what is an, what is an estimator? Estimator encapsulate all everything that you need into a single object to train a, a machine learning model. It hides a lot of TensorFlow concept that you don't have to learn, like sessions or like, it also like do the looping for you. So you don't have, now you don't have to even know about session because if you use estimator, you don't have to, to handle it by yourself. It automatically handle it in this estimator object. And once you have estimator, you can interact with all like, it, you can train, you can evaluate, predict and export safe model. If you use scikit-learn, so basically they try to, 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 to build this in a scikit-learn style, basically. And what you have to do when you use estimator is two things. First, you have to define input function. And you can define input function using tf.data that I just talked about. Second thing is you have to define something called model function. So model function is a function that get features and labels and then you have to just define how you're gonna train the model, how you're gonna evaluate the model, how you're gonna predict, and how you're gonna export the model. And that's it, you have, you, that, that's, that's all. But the good news is for standard machine learning algorithms, 
they also pre-made the model logic or model function for you. So you don't like it even easier because you don't have to even specify your own training graph. And I will show you example in a minute. So let's say you want to, like you have project, high, recommend, high recommendation project, and your goal is to recommend heights to users, right? And what the data that you have is you have hike info, you have info about users, and you have the interaction between user and hike. Like this user like this hike, or something, or how, how much the, the rating that this user gives to this height, something like that. And we can define this into a machine learning problem, very really simple one. So features is height and user, and you want to predict like if this user will like this height or not. So it's basically like label is one or zero, like or not like. So this is like standard machine learning problem. It's like a binary classification. They have this pre-made estimator called DNN classifier that you can use it immediately. So let's start with a very simple case. Let's say you just use one feature, which is hike ID. So this is not going to be personalized at all, but let, let's start simple. You use hike ID, and what you have to specify is what you're going to do with hike ID. So in here, I say do the embedding. And this is something called feature column. I will talk about it in, in a second. And then you instantiate your DNN classifier and specify how many hidden layers, hidden unit you want, and put the feature column into it. And specify that your training input, your evaluation input, and then you can train using train and eval evaluation method. And that's it. Only like a couple of lines, you can train your first model. And the good thing is, it comes with a lot of free stuff. So if you open TensorBoard, like when you specify the DNN classifier, you have to specify the uh, like model directory that you want to, to save the model. So, and when you open TensorBoard on that directory, you will see like a lot of free stuff, free summaries and metrics. So you see your training loss, evaluation loss. You will see your accuracy, and, and also for this like binary classification, you can you get like AUC, area under the curve of precision recall automatically. So if you want to do something more complicated, there's a, a feature column that can support you. What is feature column? Feature column allow you to do feature engineering and you don't have to do inside your estimator. So you do feature engineering outside and put it in something called feature columns and then the, you just train your model just like you usual thing. Uh, and they have like bunch of functions that support feature engineering uh, like bucketizing, crossing, hashing, embedding. So let's see example. Let's say that you want to put uh, more features into your model. You have tags of the hike. So it's like kids friendly or dog friendly or not, something like that. And what you want to do with this uh, feature is you, can, you want to one -hot, do one hot encoding you can use this indicator column. And let's say you have this elevation gain and you want to treat it as a numerical value, you can do numerical column and you can put also normal, normalization function. And lastly, if you want to do, use this stand as one of the feature but you want to bucketize it, then you can do this bucketize column and put everything inside a list and that's it, you can train your second model. And if you want to do a bit more complicated, like you want to make it personalized, so you have to use user features in, inside your model. The easiest thing that you can do is you can just like 
embed user ID and put it as another feature like this and then that's all everything should work just fine so another thing that I want to highlight is so I talk about DNN classifier but they also have a lot of uh, other stuff and they now have gradient booster tree I I think like most of you would know about XGBoost when you want to do a gradient booster tree. So now you can do gradient booster tree in, with TensorFlow. Like this. So the question is why would I bother using like GBT with TensorFlow? So we say if you want to compare, let's say you want to compare GBT with deep learning. So if you do like XGBoost, and you, you do deep learning in TensorFlow, and how you can compare them is like, it's not that easy. So now it like, you can compare it in a single framework. So very convenient. And I think they also support like SVM and all other stuff. But let's say that you are not satisfied and you want to do something a bit more complicated, they also support it they introduced something called head API. So before we talk about head API, we talk about what is model function first. So to train um, machine learning or neural networks, basically you have features and you specify your network. It can be like fully connected or convolution, RNN, depends on the problem. And in the end, you specified your prediction, your loss, right? And the prediction and loss, this is what they call head. So, and like, okay, the network and head becomes what it call model function. The idea is like, they have like refactor that head outside of the estimator. For example, you have DNN classifier. Now it becomes what it, you can use DNN estimator and put binary classification head into it. Okay, you might think like, so why we like put more lines instead of one line to two lines? So the idea is now you can play with a lot of heads. So if you want to not just do binary classification, you want to do multi-class or you want to use like Poisson regression head or any other head, then you can just like use this head, head API. And what I'm excited about is this multi-head because you can combine many heads into a single estimator and do multi-task learning using this API. So it's very convenient. And also, if you still think that you want to, to do a bit more, you can specify your own model function. So it takes features, labels, and more as an input and then you just like build your training graph, your evaluation graph, your prediction graph, and then return some like return something called this, uh, I think model spec or something like that. All right. Last thing is the serving, TensorFlow serving. So if you use this API, uh, estimator API so you can also save your model like in an easy manner what you have to do is there's a method called export save model and you have to just specify the uh, input rec receiver input function like how you can handle re requests when it comes to the pre uh, like the real time real, real time inference and that's all you, you need to do. Once you have this like self object, you can put it in TensorFlow serving or if you have your own API server, like for example, at Agoda, we use Scala as like the uh, serv API server for real-time serving. So we use Java API, TensorFlow Java API to load this object that was written in Python, something like that. So definitely, I recommend you to check it out, the high-level API. It's very convenient to work with. 
Okay, the third thing that I want to talk about is distributed TensorFlow. I picked this one because I didn't know before, like before I attended the summit, I didn't know that it's like, it's this easy to do distributed TensorFlow. So I just want to share with you how easy it is. So let's talk about the architecture, like distributed training architecture first. So this is like not distributed. You have single CPU, you have single GPU on one single server, right? But let's say you have multiple GPUs on a single node or single server. So, so the question is how you want, how can you distribute your training on this architecture? And the most complicated architecture is that you have multiple nodes and each node has several GPU, right? So how do we do this in TensorFlow? So today estimator you have like you you have these two two lines, right? If you use estimator, and what you have to do, you just have to put one more line, which is the uh, distribu distribution strategy. And now they have this mirrored strategy, which is uh, suitable for the case where you have a single server but multiple GPUs. So you can just put this inside the run config and then use that run config in estimator and now it, like, you can do uh, distributed training very easily. And they are now working to put more strategy inside this, uh, inside this uh, API. And I think the multi-node, like if in case that you have many servers and each server has many GPU, I think they're gonna support it soon. Also, they said like also sh check out this horror world uh, project. I think the project from Uber that they built distributed training framework on top of TensorFlow. It's gonna be a bit different than what I said before, but maybe suit for your case. So yeah, if you want to try, just install the TF Nightly. TensorFlow Hub. I think this one is the, the one that I'm most excited about because I've never heard about TensorFlow Hub before I attend the summit. And this is actually what I wanted. Like I, 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 I wanted this functionality in TensorFlow for a long time and now it becomes like it really so, so I'm, I'm really excited about it. What is TensorFlow Hub? How many of you know about TensorFlow Hub? Okay, okay, cool. <laughs> so before we talk, we talk about TensorFlow Hub, we talk about these rep repositories in software engineering world. So repositories allow you to create your code and share your code or reuse other people's code, right? So why don't we do the same with TensorFlow Hub? No, with, with machine learning, sorry. Why don't we do the same like in, in machine learning world? So that's why they created something called TensorFlow Hub that you can build tensor, machine learning model, share it, and also reuse other people's uh, model. So why, why, why is like, it's a good idea? So think about like if you want to build a machine learning, machine learning model, then you, you need a lot of things. You need algorithms, you need data, you need compute power. You need also like machine learning expert, right? But the idea is like it, the TensorFlow have these two, these four things into something called module. And then you can share your module on TensorFlow Hub and other people can reuse this module so that they don't have to have these four things. You, they can still like do something with machine learning. And one thing that uh, I want to point out is like, they call this as module, not model. Because model is like, when you have a model, you have a specific input and specific output. So it's not really like shareable. Module is something that you can like, it's composable, it's like reusable and also retainable is also important thing. So con it contains pre-trained -weight, pre weights and the TensorFlow graphs. 
And I think like for those of you who use Keras before, I think the Keras application ResNet, something like that is exactly the same thing. So th that allows you to do, to do like a uh, pre-trained model very easily. So use case for TensorFlow app, the most common use case would be to do image retraining. At Agoda, we also do image retraining, like we want to classify photo image like into a pre predefined category. Maybe it's like bedroom, kitchen, or something like that. Uh, but we don't have like millions of image, so we don't want to train it, everything from scratch. So we just like take the model that train on ImageNet and then retrain it on our data. I think like a lot of you probably like try to do it already, like doing it already. And if you go to TensorFlow Hub, you can see a lot of modules that they have. Let's see the code. This is the code for image retraining. Not retraining, but now like image using pre-trained model to classify uh, image on, on new data that you have. So you, what you have to do is just call hub.module and copy paste the URL that the, the, the model URL that you want. So in, the, in this case is the NASNet. NASNet is probably the state of the art uh, image classification architecture right now. And you can do like once you have that module, it's a function that take image as an in input and then produce features vector for you. So you can think of it as like a feature extractor. So extract the features from your image. And then once you have that features, you can just put in like a dense function and do the, your binary classification or multi-class classification as you want. The good thing is like, in order to get that feature vectors, so it used like 60, uh, 100 GPU hours to actually train that features, NASNet. So you can reuse it like, and you don't have to like, uh, use any GPU power for this thing. And also you can retrain your, your mo model as well. You just put retainable true and then put something called tag and then you also retrain your uh, image model. So available image model, modules, they have NASNet, they have PNASNet, MobileNet, also standard stuff like Inception, ResNet, MobileNet. For text classification, this is also very exciting because, okay, let's start with sentence embedding. So the idea is like, let's say you have a sentence and you want to classify if it's positive or negative. The idea if you want to like put that string, transform that string into a fixed length vector and use that vector to do the, this binary classification problem. And now they have these uh, called universal sentence encodings that allows you to actually embed sentence. So I think if you know about what to work, what to work, uh, embed each word into a fixed length vector, right? But now you can actually embed a sentence into a single vector using this universal sentence encoding. And the paper, I think it released the exact same day that the event happened, the TensorFlow Summit happened. So it's very new and you should try it. I think the uh, algorithm behind it used the transformer from the paper called Attention is All You Need. And it like trained that on like multi-tax, lot of tax, NLP related tax to get the universal sentence encoding. So if you want to use it, with TensorFlow Hub, then it's pretty easy as well. You just have to use this hub.text embedding column. And now this is the 
feature column that I talked about before in the estimator. Once you have this, you can use it inside your estimator, just like I showed you before. And of course, you can retrain it if you want. Other text modules, they have this neural network language model, what to work, and something called Elmo. And they are working on other stuff as well, adding more stuff inside TensorFlow Hub. And last thing is, you can also build your own module and put it in TensorFlow Hub and share it to other people. And I think that would be like really nice uh, to, to also collaborate or share your, your expertise to others. And last thing, this is the last topic that I going to talk about it's debugging TensorFlow. Okay, the reasons why I picked this because I myself like was I, I was really anno annoyed when I tried to debug TensorFlow code. It's very hard and it's not intuitive at all. So when these two come out, like it, it, it's going to be really helpful for you to to debug TensorFlow. The idea is you can actually have this in your tensor board. And what you can do is you can literally see tensor, tensor flow through the graph as you run like step. Like you have this step to run your graph and then you can see the, the tensor value inside each node. And that's very cool. And you can also see the source code that specify that node in your, in your code, right? And I'm go what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to do the demo that they did in the TensorFlow Summit. Okay, I hope it works. All right. Yeah. So the idea is, I'm going to train MNIST model, very simple. But it's not a usual one, it's a debug MNIST one. So what's going to happen is, okay, I train the model. All right. And this model, when, like, it gets stuck at step three. We can get only like 10% accuracy. So we suspect that something wrong, like something is going on inside, my, inside the code, right? And maybe some node is probably uh, has null value or infinity value or something like that. That is our hypothesis. But we don't know exactly which one produced this none or infinity value. And we want to debug the code using this TensorFlow debugging tool. So first thing that we have to do is we have to start a tensor board. Oops. All right. Start a tensor board with a special argument called debugger port. And you just put your debugger port. Okay. When you go to TensorBoard, you will see this thing. So this like suggests you that if you want to use the TensorFlow debugging plugin, what you have to do inside your uh, code. For example, if you use the tf.session, you, you don't use estimator. What you have to do is you just have to put this additional line, TensorBoard debug wrapper session. And then it, just, it should just work. And you have, if you do use estimator, then you do this, right? So I'm going to run the MNIST model again, but now with the special flag that will turn on this plugin.
OK. Now we have this very cool visualization. So this is like, you can see your graph here. And on the le left hand side, you can see also your, uh, I think this is the name node that you specified on your code. So you, you can see inside your accuracy name node, what other name node you have, something like that. And what you can do is you can say step. OK. And now it like, it actually take a one, one step. And the cool thing is, you can, you can click continue, and you can say, please run it until it meets some condition. And the condition that we are looking for is if, uh, if any node like contains infinity or minus infinity or none or not, right? And then we just have to do that. And we run until it meets the condition. All right. But I think this is not the. OK, I think I did something wrong. OK, OK. Can I start it over? <laughs> Sorry for that. I did something wrong. I actually know how to use this last week, so please forgive me. this meet this condition and then now it should work <coughs> okay okay it's work so it run until it meets that condition and it says this lock like this node cross entropy lock has in minus infinity value. And we can see in the graph that, okay, this is inside this graph. And what you can do is you can track like, what is the node before this lock? So it's softmax. And you can say expand and highlight and see that, okay, because softmax get like zero value. That's why when you take lock zero, it's basically minus infinity, right? And you can see the code that produced this error. OK, it's a bit hard to see, but. Yeah, OK, you can see that this is the submax logic. So when you, know, when you know that this is the error, what you can do is you can go back to your TensorFlow code and then fix it, and it should work. OK, so let's go back. So like I said before, all right, there is just additional argument that you have to specify when you open TensorBoard. And that's it for my presentation. Uh, let's see if you have any questions. Do we have time for Q&A?
So we have time for maybe one or two questions. Does anyone have a question? About So it's okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks for the question. I think if you go to TensorFlow.org, they have this tutorial on debugging TensorFlow. But I don't think they have the tutorial for interactive version yet. But they have the tutorial for the like in not not the interactive version. You can just follow that first. But everything should they say like everything should be exactly the same with the non-interactive one. It just like make it it's easier for you to do on when you visualize stuff. Yeah. I, yeah. Any other question? I set up we take the question. Oops, sorry. Yeah, uh, sure. about this debugging. So we found out that the problem is with the subclass that produced the zero value. Yeah. So when we come with the uh, log value, then we got utility. So how can we fix it? I mean, what exactly we should change in our code to prevent this error? So like the simple, simplest way, just put one in when you take log, like log minus one, right? Like, okay. yeah. Thank and you. I'll give it. 